So all of a sudden AI is everywhere. People who weren't quite sure what it was are playing with it on their phones. Is that good or bad? Yeah, so I've been um, thinking about AI for a long time since I was in college, really. Um, it was one of the things that, the sort of four or five things I thought would really uh, affect the future uh, dramatically. It, it is fundamentally profound in that the, the, the smartest creatures, as far as we know, on this earth are humans, um, is our defining characteristic. Yes. Um, we're obviously uh, weaker than, say, chimpanzees, and less agile, um, but we're all smarter. So uh, now what happens when something uh, vastly smarter than the smartest person uh, comes along in silicon form? Uh, it's very difficult to predict what will happen in that circumstance. It's called the singularity. It's, you know, it's a singularity like a black hole because yes. you, you don't know what happens after that. It's hard to predict. So I think we should be cautious with uh, AI um, and we should, I think there should be some government oversight uh, because it affects the, it, it's a danger to the public. And so when you, when you have things that are a danger to the public, uh, you know, like let's say, um, so food, food and drugs, that's why we have the Food and Drug Administration right. and the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, the FCC. Uh, we, have, we have these agencies to oversee things that uh, affect the public, where there, there could be public harm. Um, and you don't want companies cutting corners uh, on safety um, and then having people suffer as a result. So uh, that, that's why I've actually for a long time been a strong advocate of uh, AI uh, regulation. Um, so that I think regulation is, uh, f you know, I, I, it's, it's not fun to be regulated. It's, it's sort of, sort of a, somewhat of a, a somewhat arduous to be, to be, to be regulated. Um, I have a lot of experience with regula uh, regulated industries because obviously uh, automotive is hi highly regulated. You could fill this room with all the regulations that uh, are required for a production car just in the United States. And then there's a whole different set of regulations in Europe and China and the rest of the world. So uh, very familiar with being overseen by a lot of regulators. Um, and the same thing is true with rockets. You can't just willy-nilly you know, shoot rockets off, not big ones anyway. Uh, because the FAA is, uh, oversees that, um, and then even to get a launch license, you, there, there are probably ha half a dozen or more uh, federal agencies that need to approve it, uh, plus state agencies. So it's it, I'm, I'm, I've been through so many regulatory uh, situations; it's insane. And, and the, the, you know, sometimes I, I, people think I'm some sort of like regulatory maverick that sort of defies regulators uh, on a regular basis, but this is actually not the case. Uh, so, uh, in you know, once in a blue moon, rarely I will disagree with regulators. But the vast majority of the time, uh, my my companies agree with the regulations and comply. Uh, so anyway, so I think I think we should uh, take this seriously, and and we should have um, uh, a, a regulatory agency. I think it needs to start with um, a group that initially seeks uh, insight uh, into AI, uh, then solicits opinion from industry uh, and then pro has proposed rulemaking and then those rules you know uh, will probably hopefully grudgingly be accepted by uh, the, the major players in, in, in AI and, um, and we, we, I think we'll have a better chance of, of um, advanced AI being beneficial to humanity in that circumstance. So, but all regulations start with a perceived danger, and planes fall out of the sky, or food causes botulism. Yes. I don't think the average person yes. playing with AI on his iPhone perceives any danger. Can you just roughly explain what you think the dangers might be? Yeah, so the, 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 the danger, uh, really, AI is um, perhaps uh, more dangerous than, say, mismanaged uh, aircraft design or production maintenance or, or, or b bad car production uh, in the sense that it is, it has the potential, uh, however small one may regard that probability, but it is non-trivial. It has the potential of civilizational destruction. <laughs> There's movies like Terminator, but I, it wouldn't quite happen like Terminator um, because the, the intelligence would be in the data centers. Right. Uh, the robot's just the end effector. But I think perhaps uh, what you may be alluding to here is that um, Regulations are really only put into effect after something terrible has happened. That's correct. 
if that's the case for AI and we're only putting regulations after something terrible has happened, it may be too late to actually put the regulations in place. The AI may be in control at that point. You think that's real? It is, it is conceivable that AI could take control and reach a point where you couldn't turn it off and it would be making, making the decisions for people? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's, that's, the, that's definitely the, where things are headed, uh, for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, um, the, the, the things like, like say, uh, ChatGPT, which is uh, based on GPT-4 from OpenAI, which right. is a company that I uh, played a, a, a critical role in, in creating, unfortunately. Uh, Back when it was a nonprofit? <sighs> yes. Um, I mean, the, 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 the reason uh, OpenAI exists at all is that... Um, uh, Larry Page and I used to be close friends, and I would yes. stay at his house in Palo Alto, and I would talk to him late into the night about uh, AI safety. And at least my perception was that Larry was not taking uh, AI safety uh, seriously enough. Um, and um, what did he say about it? He really seemed to be one um, once once sort of a digital super intelligence, basically digital god, if you will, uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, he wanted that. Yes. He's, he's made many public statements over the years uh, that, that the whole goal of Google is uh, uh, what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence or artificial superintelligence. But, you know, and, I, and I agree with him that the, there's great potential for good, um, but there's also potential for bad. And so if, if you've got some um, radical new technology, you want to try to take the set of actions that maximize probably it, it will do good and minimize probably it will do bad things. Yes. Um, it, it can't just be health leather. Let's just go, you know, barreling forward and, you know, hope for the best. And then at one point, uh, I said, well, what about, you know, we we're going to make sure humanity's okay here. Um, <laughs> and, 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 um, uh, and then he called me a specious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, he use, did he use that term? Yes. And there were witnesses. To other, I wasn't the only one there when he called me a specious. And so... I was like, okay, that's it. Uh, I've, yes, I'm a specious. Okay, you got me. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm fully a specious. Um, busted. Um, so um, that was the last roll. At the time, uh, Google uh, had acquired DeepMind, and so Google and DeepMind together had about three quarters of all the uh, AI talent in the world. They obviously had a tremendous amount of money and uh, more computers than anyone else. So I'm like, okay, we're, we have a unipolar world here where there's just one, one company that has close to a monopoly on uh, AI talent and, uh, and, and computers, uh, like so scaled computing. And the person who's in, in charge doesn't seem to care about safety. This is not good. So, uh, so then I thought, what's, what's the, the furthest thing from Google would be like a nonprofit uh, yeah. That is fully open because Google, Google is closed uh, for profit. So that's why the open and open AI refers to open source, uh, you know, transparency, so people know what's going on. Yes. And that it, it, we don't want to have like a, a. I mean, while I'm normally in favor of for profit, we don't want this to be a sort of a profit maximizing of demon course. from hell. That's you know? right. <laughs> that just never stops. Right. <laughs> so that, that's how open AI was. Would, would, so you want specious incentives here. Incentives that yes, like, I think we want we want pro human. Yeah, let's make the future good for the humans. Yes, yes, because we're humans. So can you just put it? I keep pressing, but just just for people who haven't thought this through and aren't familiar with it, and the cool parts of of artificial intelligence are so obvious. You know, write your college paper for you. Write a limerick about yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a lot there that's fun and useful. But can you be more precise about what's potentially dangerous and scary? Like, what could it do? What specifically are you worried about? Okay, going with old sayings, the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, so the, if you have um, a super intelligent uh, AI that is capable of writing uh, incredibly well and, and in a way that is very influential, um, you know, convincing, uh, and then, and, and, is, and is constantly figuring out what is more, what is more, what is more convincing to people over time, and then enter social media, for example, Twitter, uh, but also Facebook and others, you know, um, and, and potentially manipulates public opinion in a way that is very bad. Um, how would we even know? What's happening is they're training the AI to lie. Yes. It's bad. To lie. To That's lie. exactly right. And to yes. withhold information. To lie and, and 
Yes, and, and um, to, to, yeah, exactly. To, to either you know, comment on some things, not comment on other things, but but not to say what it, what what the data uh, actually uh, demands that it say. Exactly. Um, so, um, how did it get this way? I thought it's, it's, you funded it at the beginning. What happened? Yeah, well, that would be ironic. But faith, the most ironic outcome is the most likely. It seems. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing that. That's good. That's actually from a friend of mine, Jonah, who came up with that one. I actually have a slight variant on that, which is the most entertaining outcome is the most likely. But that's entertaining as viewed from a third-party viewer. <laughs> right. Like, uh, so if we're like an alien TV from on show. High. Yes. Yeah. Um, like you could go see a movie about World War One, and they're being blown to bits and gassed and everything in the, in the trenches. And it's like you're eating popcorn and having a soda. You know, it's yeah. fine. Uh, not so great for the people in the movie. True. This is Occam's Razor, the simplest explanation is most likely. Jonah's variant, uh, which is um, irony, and then my variant, which is uh, uh, the, the most entertaining as seen by a third-party audience, um, which seems to be mostly true. Um, but it seems so, true in this case. So you gave them, uh, did you give them a lot? I came up with the name and uh, the concept and pushed, uh, had a number of dinners around the, the Bay Area uh, with, uh, you know, with, with some of the people, the leading figures in uh, AI. Um, and I helped recruit the initial team. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, Ilya Sitskaya, who, who was uh, really quite fundamental to the success of uh, OpenAI, uh, it was, I, I, I put a tremendous amount of effort into recruiting Ilya. And he changed his mind a few times and ultimately decided to go with OpenAI. But if he had not gone with OpenAI, OpenAI would not have succeeded. I really put a lot, a lot of effort into creating this, this, this organization to serve as a counterweight to Google. And then I kind of took my eye off the ball, I guess, and uh, they are now closed source. Um, and they are obviously for profit and they're um, closely allied with Microsoft. Uh, you know, in effect, Microsoft uh, has a very strong say, if not um, directly controls uh, OpenAI at this point. Um, so you really have an OpenAI and Microsoft situation, and then at Google DeepMind uh, are, the, are the two sort of heavyweights in this arena. So it seems like the world needs a third option. Yes. So I, 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 I think I will create a third option, um, although it's starting very late in the game, of course. Can it um, be done? I don't know. I think it's, we'll, we'll see. It's uh, it's definitely starting late, um, but I will, I will, I will try to create a third option, um, and that third option, hopefully, does more more good than harm. Uh, like the intention with OpenAI was uh, obviously to do good, but it's not clear whether it's actually doing good or whether it's. I, I can't tell at this point, um, except that I'm worried about the fact that. Uh, it's being it's being trained to be politically correct, which is simply another way of, of being untruth, saying untruthful things. Yes. So that's that's a bad sign. There's certainly a path to AI dystopia is to train AI to be deceptive. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to start something which I know you could call Truth GBT or uh, a maximum truth seeking AI that tries to understand the nature of the universe. And I think this this might be the best path to safety in the sense that uh, an AI that cares about understanding the universe, uh, it is unlikely to annihilate humans because we are an interesting part of the universe. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> they would think that. I, I think, it would, I, you know, because, yeah, like, like, we, we, like huma humanity could um, decide to hunt down all the chimpanzees and kill them, but we yes. don't. Because right. we're, we're, we're actually glad that they exist. Yes. And, um, and we, we aspire to protect their habitats. But we feel that way because we have souls and that makes us sentimental and reflective, it gives us a moral sense, it, longings. Can a machine ever have those things? Can a machine be sentimental? Can it appreciate beauty? Well, I mean, we're getting to, into some, you know, philosophical areas that are hard to resolve. Um, you know, I, I, I take somewhat of a scientific view, view of things, which is that we, we might have a soul or we might not have a soul. I don't know. Um, it feels like I, we have. I feel like I've got some sort of consciousness that exists on a plane um, that is not the one we observe. Yes, that is certainly how how I feel. But it, it could be an illusion. I don't know. Um, but for, for 
Um, for AI, uh, in terms of, of, of uh, understanding beauty, it's a different sort of appreciating beauty and being able to um, create incredibly beautiful art. Yes. Will AI be able to create incredibly beautiful art? It already does. Yes, I know. If you see some of the mid-journey... Uh, I have. ...this stuff, it's incredible. It is. Um, so, um, no, no question that it can create art that we, that we perceive as uh, stunning, really. Um, and um, it's doing... So, it's still images now, but it won't be long before it's doing uh, movies and shorts and, you know, like, movies just a series of, of frames with audio. Um, but at that point, because it can mimic people and voices, any image, it can mimic reality itself so effectively. Yeah. I mean, how could you have a criminal trial? I mean, how could you ever believe that evidence was authentic, for example? And I don't mean like in 30 years, I mean like next year. I mean, that seems totally disruptive to the way, to all of our institutions. But, but I'm not so worried. I, I think it's more like um, our... You know, will, will humanity um, c control its destiny or not? Um, will we have a future that is better than the past or not? You bought Twitter famously. You've got a lot of other businesses and a lot going on. Yes. You said you bought it because you believe in speech, free speech. You've had a lot of hassle since you bought it. In retrospect, was it worth buying it? I mean, it remains to be seen as to whether this was... Uh, Financially smart. Uh, currently, it is. It is not. Uh, you know, we just revalued the company at less than half of uh, the acquisition price. Did you really? Yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, no, my my timing was terrible for for when the uh, offer was made because it was uh, you know right before advertising plummeted and yeah. um, you you caught the high water mark. I noticed. Yeah, yeah. So I must be a real genius here. Um, <laughs> My my timing is amazing. <laughs> um, since I had bought it for at least twice as much as it should have been bought for, um, but some things are priceless. And um, so the the whether I lose money or not, that is a secondary issue compared to uh, ensuring the uh, strength of democracy. Uh, and free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy. Yes. Um, and in, the the speech needs to be as uh, transparent and truthful as possible. Um, so we've, we've got a, a huge push uh, on Twitter to be as truthful as possible. We've got this uh, community notes feature, which is great. Um, it is great. It is awesome. Um, yeah. And it's like... I saw it this morning. Yeah. It was far more honest than the New York Times. It's, it's great. Yeah. We put a lot of effort to ensuring that community notes does not get gamed or, or have biases. Uh, it is simply cares about what, what is the most accurate thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes truth can be a little bit elusive, but you, yes. but you can still aspire to get closer to it. Yes. Um, uh, you know, and so, um, and, and I think the, the effect of uh, community notes uh, is more powerful than, than people may realize because once people know that they, they could get noted, um, you know, community noted on Twitter, then uh, they'll think the, more carefully about what they say. Uh, they are likely, it, basically, it's an encouragement to be more truthful and less deceptive. When you jumped into this, though, when you bought it, did you understand, well, clearly you understood its importance, so you wouldn't have bought it. Uh, Twitter, yes. Right. But it, it's not the biggest, but it's the most important in the social media companies. But did you understand the kind of ferocity you'd be facing, the attacks you'd be facing from power centers in the country? Um, I thought there'd probably be some um, negative reactions, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm, not, I, I'm sure everyone would not be pleased with, the, with, with it. Um, but um, at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if the public is happy with it, that's what matters. Um, and the public will speak with their actions. Oh, the, the, I mean, the, 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 you, if, if they find truth, Twitter to be useful, they will use it more. And if they find it to be not useful, they will use it less. If they find it to be the best source of truth, I think they will use it more. You know, th now there's, there's obviously <laughs> a lot of um, organizations that are used to having sort of unfettered influence uh, on Twitter um, that no longer have that. We used and to the New York Times of their of their badge this morning, and then you called them diarrhea. You called them. <laughs> okay. You did. You did. I'm just I'm just quoting you. You you, yes. you described their Twitter feed as diarrhea. I, I said it was the Twitter equivalent Twitter equivalent of diarrhea. Okay, it's not literally diarrhea, but no, no it's a uh, you know 
to a metaphor, um, <laughs> but an accurate one. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the uh, at NY Times uh, Twitter feed, it's uh, unreadable. Uh, it's like they, because what they do is they they tweet every single article, even the ones that are uh, boring, even ones that don't make it into the paper. So, uh, so it's just nonstop, is zillion tweets a day with no. Uh, you know, they really should just be saying like, "What are the top tweets? Yes. Yeah, like, what, what, what are the what are the what are the big stories of the day? Uh, I don't know. Put out like ten or something. You know, so, some number that's manageable. Um, as opposed to right now, if you if you were to follow uh, NY at NY Times on Twitter, you're going to get barraged with like hundreds of tweets a day. Yeah. Um, and your whole feed will be filled with NY Times. So. Um, that, that's, that's, uh, this is something I would recommend actually for all publications, uh, which is uh, for your primary feed, um, only put out your best stuff. I kind of think I know a thing or two about how to use Twitter because uh, you know, I, I was the most interacted with account on the whole system uh, before the acquisition, before, before the acquisition closed. I didn't have the most number of followers, but I had the most number of interactions. And so I clearly know uh, something about how to use Twitter. You know, people's attention is limited, so just make sure you put the stuff that's most important there. So because, you know, you and people like you do interact on Twitter, it's obviously enormously powerful in shaping public opinion. It's where a lot of ideas and trends are incubated. Yeah. You know, that's why you Absolutely. bought it. It's also a magnet for intel agencies from around the world. And yes. one of the things we learned after you started opening the books is that they were exerting influence from within Twitter. I mean, it was... Absurd. Um, Did you know that going in? No. I, since, since I've been a heavy Twitter user since 2009, um, my it's it's sort of like I'm in the matrix. I mean, I can see like things. Do things feel right? Do they not feel right? What what tweets are, am I being shown as recommended? Uh, like like I, I get a feel like what, what accounts are making comments? Uh, where are the comments uh, eerily similar? Yeah. Um, and uh, and then you look at the account and it's just obviously a fake photo and uh, you know uh, the, 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 it's just obviously a bot cluster uh, yes. over and over again. So I started to get like just more and more uneasy about the the, the Twitter situation. I started I was starting to feel like something's wrong in the state of Denmark here. There's, there's, there's something feels wrong about the platform. It, it seemed to be just drifting in, in a. I, I couldn't place it exactly. Just ahead of, it, it felt like it was drifting in a bad direction. So then I was like, and and my conversations with the the board and management seemed to confirm my intuition about that. But basically, I was convinced these guys do do not care about fixing Twitter. Uh, and and uh, and I had a bad feeling about where I was headed based on the conversations, conversations I had with them. So then I was like, you know what I. I I'll try acquiring it and see if that's see if acquiring it is is possible. Um, now I didn't have enough cash to acquire it, so I would need you know support from others, um, from some of the existing investors. Uh, I would also need like a lot of debt, and um, so it wasn't clear to me whether a, an acquisition would succeed. But I thought I would try, and uh, ultimately it, it did succeed. Anyway, here we are. Um, but when you got there, and all of a sudden you own it, and all the data on the service belongs to you. Well, it belongs to the people, in my view, but yes. But but you can see what it is, and you can yes. see what they've been doing, and you can see who's been working there. You you were shocked to find out that various intel agencies were affecting its operations? Uh, the, the, the degree to which uh, various government agencies had effectively had full access to everything that was going on on Twitter uh, blew my mind. Um, I was not aware of that. Would that include people's DMs? Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, because the DMs are not encrypted. So one of the first, you know, one of the things that we're about to release uh, is the ability to encrypt your DMs. That's pretty heavy duty, though, because a lot of well-known people, reporters talking to their sources, government officials, the richest people yeah. in the world, sure. they're DMing each other. And the assumption, obviously, it was incorrect, but was that that's private, but that was being read by various governments. Uh, yeah, that seems to be, yes. It's scary. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, so... Uh, like I said, we're moving to um, have the DMs be optionally encrypted. I mean, you know, there's like a lot of DM conversations which are, you know, just chatting with friends. It's For sure. not, not not important. Of course. Um, it's hopefully coming out later this month, uh, but no later than next month. Uh, is the ability to toggle encryption on on or off. So if you if you ha are in a conversation you think is sensitive, you can just toggle encryption on, and then no one at Twitter can see what you're talking about. 
they, they could put a gun to my head and I couldn't, I couldn't tell, I couldn't, uh, the, 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 that, that's like sort of the gun to the head test. If, if somebody puts a gun to my head and I, can I still not uh, see your DMs, that should be, that's the acid test. Yes. Um, and that's how, that's, that's how it should be if you want your... Have you had complaints from various governments about doing this? I haven't had direct complaints to me. I've had sort of like some indirect complaints. I think people are a little concerned about complaining to me directly in case I tweet about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> they're like, uh-oh. Uh, so they're sort of trying to be more roundabout than that. You know, I mean, if, if, if I got something that was uh, unconstitutional from the U.S. government, I would say, uh, my reply would be to send them a copy of the you know, First Amendment and just say, like, uh, what part of this are we getting wrong? <laughs> you have a lot of government. You have a lot of government contracts. What part of this are we getting wrong? Please tell me. I mean, it's a pretty. No, I'm just saying. But you're kind of exposed in your other businesses. So this is a, just in case our viewers aren't following this. This is not. You're not just like a journalist taking a stand on behalf of the First Amendment. You're a guy with big government contracts, giving the finger to the government. Do you think um, Twitter will be as central to this presidential campaign as it was in the last several? I think it will play a significant role in elections, not just domestically, but internationally. The goal of new Twitter is to be um, as fair and even-handed as possible, uh, so not favoring any political uh, ideology, uh, but uh, just um, yeah, be, being, being, uh, being fair at all. Why doesn't uh, Facebook do this? I know that Zuckerberg has said, and I take him at face value, that he... <laughs> I, I, well, I do, I do really? actually in this way that he is a kind of old fashioned liberal who doesn't like to censor. He has, but he, you know, like, why wouldn't a company like that take the stand that you have taken, which is pretty rooted in American traditional political custom, you know, for free speech? My understanding is that um, Zuckerberg spent uh, $400 million in the last election nominally in a get out the vote campaign but really fundamentally in support of democrats is that accurate or not accurate that is accurate yes does that sound unbiased to you no it doesn't yes so you don't see hope that facebook will approach this as a, a, a non-aligned arbiter you've allowed donald trump back on twitter he hasn't taken you up on your offer because he's got his own thing right do you think he will go back on twitter well, that's that's obviously up to him. Um, you know, my, my job is to, uh, I, you know, I, I take the, the freedom of speech just very seriously. So, it, it's um, you know, I didn't I didn't vote for Donald Trump. I actually voted for Biden. Not, not saying I'm, I'm I'm a huge fan of Biden because I, I I would think that would probably be inaccurate. Uh, but um, you know, we have difficult choices to make in these presidential uh, yep. elections. It's not. I, I, I would prefer, frankly, that we we, we put someone, just a normal person, <laughs> as president, yeah. a normal person with common sense, uh, and whose values are smack in the middle of the country, you know, just you know, center of the normal distribution, and uh, I think be, that they would be great. You know, I think we have made maybe being president not that much fun, you know, <laughs> to be totally frank meant a shrinking pie, obviously, for uh, most uh, of the traditional media companies um, and made them more desperate to uh, get uh, clicks, to get, to get, you know, get attention. Um, and uh, it's made them, when, when, you know, when, they're ha when they're in sort of a desperate state, they will then tend to really push uh, headlines that get the most clicks, whether those headlines are accurate or not. Um, so it's resulted in my view, I think, probably, I think most people would agree, uh, a, a less truthful, less accurate news. Um, so, uh, because they, they just got to get a rise out of people. Um, and uh, I think it's also increased the negativity of the news because yeah. uh, I think we humans instinctually uh, respond more to negative. I think we have an instinctual negative bias, uh, which which kind of makes sense in that, like, uh, if, if um, like, let's say, you're, you're, uh, like, it's more important to remember where we, where was the lion or where was the tribe that wants to kill my tribe than where is the bush with berries. Yes. Like, one's like a permanent negative outcome, 
<laughs> and the other is like, well, I might go hungry. <laughs> yeah. So mean, meaning that there's an asymmetry in um, sort of an evolved asymmetry in negative versus positive stuff. Um, and, and, and also historically, the negative stuff would have been quite proximate, like it would have been near, represented a real danger to you as a person um, if you heard negative news. You, you, because historically, you know, like a few hundred years ago, we, we're not hearing about what negative things are happening on the other side of the world or, or on the other side of the country. We're only we're hearing about negative things in our village. Um, things that could actually have a, 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 a bad effect on you. Whereas now we're hearing about, I mean, the news very often seems to attempt to uh, answer the question, what is the worst thing that happened on Earth today? <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why you said after reading that, you know? Do you read any legacy media outlets? I, I mean, I really get most of my news from Twitter at this point. It, it is the number one news, news source, I think, uh, in the world at this point. What percentage of your staff did you fire at Twitter? One of the great business stories of the year. <laughs> I think we're about we're about twenty uh, percent of uh, the original size. Uh, so eighty percent left. Uh, yes. So I mean, a lot of people voluntarily. Sure, 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 but but it's eighty percent are gone from the day that, you took that's over. That's correct. Yes. So how do you run the company with only twenty percent of the staff? Uh, it turns out uh, you don't need uh, that, all that many people to run Twitter. But eighty percent—that's a lot. Um, yes. Uh, over. I mean, if you're, if you're not trying to run some sort of. Uh, glorified activist organization uh, with, with, uh, and you don't care that much about censorship, then uh, you can really let go of a lot of people, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> how many others, without naming names, but how many, I had dinner with somebody who runs a big company recently who said, I'm really inspired by Elon. And I said, you, the free speech stuff? He goes, no, the firing <laughs> the staff stuff. Yeah. Um, how, many, how many other CEOs have come to you um, to talk about this? I, I spend a lot of time at work, uh, so it's not like I'm meeting with lots of people. They see what, I, what actions I've taken. Um, and, um, but I, I think we just had a situation at Twitter where it was uh, absurdly overstaffed, you know? So it wasn't, uh, you know, like, you, you look at say, like, what does it really take to operate Twitter? Um, you know, I mean, most of what we're talking about here is a, a group text uh, service at scale. Um, like. I, how many people are really needed for that, you know? Um, and if you look at the, you say like, uh, what has been the product development uh, over time with Twitter? And you like, so like, you know, years versus product improvements, and it's like a pretty flat line. So what are they doing? You know, uh, it took a year to add an edit button that doesn't work most of the time. I mean, this is, I feel like if it was a comedy situation here, you know? Um, you're not making cars, you know. Uh, it's very difficult to make cars um, or get rockets to orbit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, it, the real question is like, how did it get so absurdly overstaffed? Uh, this is insane. Um, so, anyway, that's, and it's clearly working. Um, in fact, I think it's working better than ever. It's about, we, we've increased the uh, responsiveness of the system by, in some cases, over 80%. We're trying to make, make Twitter the most trusted place on the internet, the least untrustworthy place on the internet. I don't think anyone should trust the internet, but, but maybe we can make Twitter the least untrustworthy. Like I said, try to get uh, the, the truth to the people um, as, as best we can. You've heard people say we should just blow up the server farms because there's no way to, once it, this gets rolling, there's no way to slow it down. What do you think of that? Well, the, the, the really heavy-duty intelligence is not going to be uh, distributed all over the place. It'll be in uh, a limited number of server centers. If you say, like, very, like very sort of deep AI, heavy-duty AI. It's not, um, it's not going to be in your laptop or your phone. It's, it's going to be in, you know, a situation where there's, like, 100,000 uh, really powerful computers working together in a service center. So it's not... So it's, it's not like subtle, and there there are a limited number of places where that that can happen. In fact, you could you, if you could just you can just look at the heat signature from space, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it'll be very obvious. Uh, I'm not suggesting we we go and blow up to service centers right now, but there may be some. It may be wise to have some sort of contingency plan, where, where the government's got an ability to shut down shut down power to these uh, service centers. Like uh, you don't have to blow it up; you can just cut the power. Um, 
And what would trip... Or cut connectivity as well. That's another way. Right. Yeah. But what would trip that switch, do you think, in your mind? What would be the threshold that you'd have to pass to warrant the government cutting off your power or cutting off your signal? Well, I mean, I guess if we lost control of some super AI, um, like for some reason, like, like the things that would normally work to do a passive shutdown, like the administrator passwords, if they somehow stop working, um, where, we, where we can't uh, slow down or, or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I don't have a precise answer, but if, if there's something that we're concerned about um, and, and, uh, and are, are unable to stop it with with uh, software commands, then uh, we probably want to have some kind of hardware off switch. Yes, I think you know can't hurt. Have you talked to <laughs> since you know Larry Page one, and yeah. you obviously you know the OpenAI yeah, guys because you started we it. Definitely have one. <laughs> do, do, have you talked to the the people who run these two the biggest AI companies about this recently? I haven't talked to Larry Page uh, in a few years because he got very upset with me about OpenAI. Uh, oh. So when when OpenAI was created, uh, it it did it did shift things into a from unipolar world where Google Google and DeepMind controlled, uh, you know, like I said, three quarters of all AI talent to where there's now sort of a bipolar world or OpenAI and Google DeepMind and their uh, and now, weirdly, it, it seems uh, open eyes are maybe ahead. Um, so, uh, so I have had conversations with um, the open AI team, and Sam Altman. I haven't talked to Larry Page because he doesn't want to talk to me anymore uh, for a few years. Uh, Can I ask you just about, since you've been around a lot of this, the thinking? So why would anyone not be a speciesist, be human-centered in his thinking about technology? Like what's the thinking there? Um, I think what he's trying to say is that, um, if I were to guess, uh, that he that uh, all consciousness uh, should be treated uh, equally, um, and whether that is digital or biological. Hmm. And you disagree. I disagree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially if the uh, digital. Uh, consciousness or whatever you want to call it, digital intelligence, uh, decides to curtail the biological intelligence. Right. So you're just building your own slave master, and why would you do that? Doesn't sound great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should, we, we should at least, uh, we, no need to rush, you know. <laughs> like, what's the hurry? <laughs> Where, where's the fire? <laughs> How, uh, well, what, I mean, tell us about the hurry. So this for, I know you've been talking about this for years, and on the sort of the periphery of our attention, we've heard Elon Musk talking about AI. But for most people, it's been like three months since they've had any interaction with this at all. Um, so what's the timeline here? At what point does it start to really change our society, do you think? I think it starts to have a, a, probably a, a, an impact this year. GPT-4, uh, now it's like writing poetry. Um, and pretty decent poetry, actually. Pretty decent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, skill at rhyming is incredible. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's coherent. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it's, you've got a narrative. Like, like, yes, so you've got that's a, right. Yeah. So you could say that's like... That's hard to do. Like most humans can't do that. That's true. So it's already past the point of what most humans can do. Uh, most humans cannot write as well as uh, uh, ChatGPT. Um, and, they certainly, and, and no, no human can write that well that fast, as right. the best of my knowledge. Uh, so uh, maybe Shakespeare. How can you have a democracy with technology like that? I mean, if democracy is, you know, government by the people, each person's vote is equal to every other person's vote. I mean, and people are choosing their votes freely. Can you have a democracy with this? Well, that's why I raise the concern of um, AI being a significant influence in elections. Um, and, and even if you say that AI doesn't have agency, well, it's very likely that people will use the AI um, as a tool uh, in elections. Um, and then, it, you know, if the AI is smart enough, it, it, are they using the tool or is the tool using them? So I think things, things are getting weird, and they're getting weird fast. So you've seen a couple of regional bank collapses. Yeah. And we've been told that's not a big deal. 
that these are isolated and each one collapse for unique reasons. They're not, it's not systemic in any sense. What, what's your sense, your sense of the stability of the American banking system? Well, it's, it's actually at this point a global banking system of problem. It is. Um, so the, uh, you know, we have a situation here where it's not merely, it's not that the, the canary in the coal mine has died, but the miners are starting to die too. The, you know, the <laughs> so, and, and, you know, Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsing uh, overnight um, is a one hell of a big canary. You know, it's more like a toki. I mean, it's not just, it's not like some small fry thing. I think that there, there is a serious danger uh, with the uh, global banking system. Um, there's, there's a strong argument that the, uh, if you were to actually uh, mark to market the portfolios of the banks, the loans and whatnot, uh, that the entire banking industry would have negative equity. It feels that way. Yes. Um, so if you look at, say, uh, commercial real estate like offices and whatnot, the whole work from home thing has substantially reduced uh, office usage uh, in cities around the world. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think San Francisco is at 40 percent uh, off. And if San Francisco is like an extreme example, but it's like, I think it's on 40 percent vacancy. Um, uh, even, even New York has, uh, I think almost all cities at this point have, have record vacancies in commercial real estate. So um, now, now the commercial real estate used to be something that was a grade A asset. Um, that uh, if a bank had commercial real estate holdings, th those would be considered the highest uh, s security, the safe, sure. some of the safest, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, assets you could have. Now that is not the case anymore. Uh, you, you, one company after another is canceling their leases or not renewing their leases, uh, or if they go bankrupt, you ha the, 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 there's nothing for the the bank who owns that real estate to go after because they're you know, previously strong company now dead. What do you, what do you, what do you go after at that point? Um, so we really haven't seen the commercial real estate shoe drop. That's more like a anvil, not a shoe. Um, so the, the stuff we've seen thus far <laughs> actually hasn't even. It, 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 it's, all, it's only slightly uh, um, real estate portfolio degradation. Uh, but that will become a very serious thing later this year, in my, in my view. Um, I think if we see, which we're likely to see, a drop in house prices because the uh, interest rates are too high. And uh, for most people when buying a house, they look at the monthly payment. Of course. Um, if you're a 30-year 30, 30 mortgage, uh, the vast majority of it is interest. So if the Fed rate is high, um, you have a, um, a high base interest rate effectively the price you can pay for the house drops because you now have to pay more interest, which means that if you've got a fixed monthly payment, you can now afford to buy a house for less, less money. It effectively drops the, the prices of houses. Yes. This is the kind of thing that tends to accelerate. Uh, so that, so that, that then you can get negative equity in the home market as well. And so, so if, if banks end up having loan losses in both their commercial and well, they're definitely going to have loan losses in their commercial portfolio, but also in their mortgage portfolio. This is um, a dire situation. Um, the, the, there, there, is, there is a solution to mitigate the uh, magnitude of the damage here, which is for the Fed to lower the rate. Uh, but uh, they raised the rate again. Um, now, uh, if I recall correctly, which I, you know, Important caveat. I, I think the last time the, the Fed raised rates going into a recession was 1929. What happened next? Yeah, the Great Depression. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the concern, I'm going to tell so, you nothing you don't know, but the concern is if the Fed drops rates again, then inflation will accelerate, and you can't do that in an election year. <laughs> so inflation is going to happen no matter what. Huh. If you increase the money supply, um, you get inflation. Right. So there's, no, there's not some magical cure for getting rid of inflation, um, except to increase the productivity, the output, output of uh, goods and services. So 
If you say like, like what is money? Um, you've got you've got you've got these sort of um, it's basically numbers in a database that's that that sum up to some come up to some total. Then you've got the uh, output of goods and services of the economy, and the as long as the ratio of money to ratio of, of, of goods and services stays, if that if that stays constant, you have no no inflation. If uh, if you add more money, if you add money to the system faster than you increase uh, goods and services, right. then you have inflation. Um, so all of these COVID sort of stimulus bills uh, were not paid for. They were they were just generated more uh, currency, more, more you know, uh, more more money was 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 created because. The, the the federal government uh, the checks never the, the, the checks always pass uh, you know until, unless you hit a debt limit which there's probably going to be some debt limit crisis later this year but uh, provided you haven't hit the debt limit the the federal government uh, unlike state governments or city governments uh, or individuals can simply issue more money um, and that's what they did um, I mean as old saying goes that there's no there's no free lunch. Um, so, uh, if you could just issue massive amounts of money without negative consequences, why don't we just take that to the limit and make everyone a trillionaire? Well, well they, I mean, they tried that in Venezuela. How'd that, how'd that work out? Well, they had to eat zoo animals. Right. It's not good, you know. There's no free lunch. There's, there's not some ability to issue money and not have inflation. People sometimes take the fact that, like, we're here on Earth for granted, you know, and that there's the... Uh, Consciousness is just a th you know, normal thing that happens, but to the best of my knowledge, we see no evidence of uh, conscious uh, life anywhere, uh, anywhere in the universe. So it, it might be there. Um, you know, in physics they call it sort of the, the Fermi paradox. After uh, when Enrico Fermi, who's an amazing physicist, uh, asked the fundamental question: Where are the aliens? Yeah. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know. <laughs> um, where are the aliens? And I, I think if, if anyone would know about aliens on Earth, it would probably be me. I would um, think. Yeah, I'm you know, very familiar with space stuff. Um, and I've seen no evidence of aliens. So I would, I would immediately tweet, you know, tweet it out. This is split second. I'd be like, that would be like one of all time, probably a top tweet of all time. I found one, guys. <laughs> this is a jackpot. <laughs> this is some 8 billion likes, you know. Um, Next level jackpot if you find the, the aliens. Like, I don't think they're keeping this under, a, you know, and it was like some um, uh, general, I think, in the 60s who, who, who where they said, like, show us the aliens, like Area 51, etc. And he said, like, listen, we are constantly trying to get the defense budget to uh, expand. And uh, you know what would really get uh, no arguments for anyone? Uh, if we pulled out an alien <laughs> and said, we need money to protect ourselves from these guys. <laughs> How much money do you want? You got it. <laughs> they look dangerous. <laughs> so, the fastest way to get a defense budget increase would be for me to pull out an alien, you know. We're like, yeah. I mean, it could be the invasion fleet. It could be arriving any minute. Who knows? So, um, you know, I, I digress. But, but you were saying that our consciousness makes us unique in the universe as far as we know. And that we yes, I'm not saying that we are unique. I'm simply stating to the best of my knowledge that there is no evidence for other uh, yes. conscious life. I, I, I hope that there is, and I hope they're peaceful, uh, obviously, uh, two important characteristics. Um, but um, I'm just saying we, we haven't seen anything yet. So, yeah. um, but you think that we take our existence here for granted? Yeah, I think we, there are threats to it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So... Um, I, I just think we should not assume that civilization is robust. Um, and if you if you look at the history uh, of civilizations, the rise and fall of the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Sumerians, um, Rome, you know, this uh, th throughout the world there've been the rise and fall of many civilizations. Um, so there's there's an arc, there's sort of a life, uh, sort of a, a life cycle arc to to civilizations, just as there is to to, to individual humans. Yes. And, um, and and I think we just want to make sure that that you know uh, we we have civilization go onward and upward, um, and uh, that's for example why I'm concerned about decreasing birth rates and and um, the fact that for example Japan uh, had twice as many deaths last year as births. 
So the, the you know, that that's and and they're they're a leading indicator. It's this is. Can, can I say and, and you've you've written a lot and talked a lot about this, but can I just ask you to pause just for a parenthetical note? Why is that? I mean, the urge to have sex and to procreate is, after breathing and eating, the most basic urge. Yes. How has it been subverted? Well, it's just the in the past <laughs> we could rely upon. Um, you know, so simple uh, limbic system rewards uh, yes. in order to procreate. Um, but uh, once you have birth control um, and you know uh, abortions and whatnot, now you, now you now you can still satisfy the limbic instinct, but not procreate. Um, so we don't we haven't yet evolved to deal with that because this is all fairly recent. You know, the last fifty years or so um, for for birth control. You know, so I'm, I'm sort of worried that, hey, civilization, you know, don't, if we don't make enough people to at least sustain our numbers, perhaps increase a little bit, then civilization is going to crumble. There's this, the old question of, like, uh, will civilization end with a, a bang or a whimper? Well, it's currently trying to, to end with a whimper in adult diapers. Yes. Uh, which is depressing as hell. The most depressing. The mo I mean, seriously, yeah. yeah. War is less depressing. Yeah, I'd rather go out with a bang. Yeah, and then with your shoes on. Yeah, not with your more exciting. On. Yeah. <laughs>